On October 23rd, 1956, war broke out in Hungary. Students marched on the capital demanding reforms to the oppressive Soviet government, and by midwinter, my mother was drugged and gagged and carried across the border in a sack. She was three, and my grandmother didn't want her crying, giving the family away, so they drugged and gagged her. This wasn't the first time that my grandmother had to take desperate measures like this to protect herself. A decade earlier, she had been released from Auschwitz concentration camp. I begin this video essay in this way to provide you with a sort of backdrop upon which you can interpret everything that follows. This essay is my formal application to the Walter Rodney Award, an award given to a Binghamton University graduate student whose work exemplifies the scholar-activist spirit of black historian Walter Rodney. I'm making this video with a bit of chagrin. What right do I have a hyper-educated white male who's benefited so much from the capitalism and colonialism that's defined the West? What right do I have to an award that is in the name of black liberation? Perhaps none. In his book Black Skin, White Masks, Franz Fanon wrote about universal liberation. He said that it can only be achieved by addressing the particular injustices that are pressed upon particular identities. We do not live in a colorblind world, Fanon said, and our striving for justice is hampered by any illusion that we do. My whiteness and my maleness gives me privilege. Privilege, which perhaps disqualifies me from an award in the name of Walter Rodney. But the activist tradition which I come from, the Occupy tradition, claimed in Zuccotti Park that all of our grievances are connected. Fanon's insight can be read another way. By identifying with the particular grievances of our particular histories, we can come to understand the universal things which make us all human. Identity takes center stage here. We have a problem of identification. We do not know whom we are. And that is why this gathering is of great symbolic importance, because it is an act of identification. We are saying that we identify with the African people of the African continent. We are saying that we are an African people. For Rodney, Claiming identity was a critical step in the struggle for liberation. It is only after articulating who we are that we can begin to speak to our universal commonalities. Walter Rodney was a descendant of slavery. I am a descendant of the Holocaust. The impact of these two injustices has ramified very differently throughout history, but both have required that their victims reclaim their identities in the aftermath. So, in what follows, I'm going to describe to you my identity as best I can. That's why this is a video here with my identity inside it. So, after the second time war forced my grandmother from her home, my family found their way to an Austrian refugee camp and eventually to New York. By the time I was born, that saga of homelessness was decades finished, but I think it left an ancestral mark upon me nonetheless. My parents divorced when I was an infant, so I spent my childhood being shuttled back and forth between two houses. I'm not sure that either one of them ever really felt like home, at least not the way that I came to define home after I moved into Kraft's house. Kraft's was the communal house that I lived in during college. We shared a large kitchen and cooked dinner together every night. We shared food, we shared space, we shared culture. And all of that sharing, it did this really funny thing. There were times that I couldn't shake the feeling that I was living inside some sort of collective creature. Kraft's house was this liminal space where the boundary between personal identity and collective identity could begin to blend. And so for the first time in my life, I felt as if I really belonged somewhere. And so I came to define home as that feeling of the blurring of boundaries, collective identity. Kraft's house blurred boundaries between public and private, between individual and collective. There was just this feeling of liminality about the space, and probably the place where that was clearest was in the dumpster. We tend to think of trash in this sort of like all-encompassing category of trash as anything I don't want. 
and you take everything you don't want and you put it in a pile and you wrap a pile in plastic and you send it away. At its core, trash is only trash because people decide that it's useless, not because it actually is useless. This footage comes from a documentary about the Cleaner's Kitchen, the collective dumpster restaurant that I started in 2013. The project came out of Kraft's house, and so its style of activism took on a very particular flavor. You know, so I, I view this as a form of activism, but it's not, it's not policy-oriented activism. It's not like I'm gonna, you know, march on Trader Joe's and tell them to stop putting their food in the dumpster. You know, in this weird way, I'm actually very reliant on them. So it, it's activism in that I am, I'm trying to, to create this different space where people can, can think about different ideas, create a radical space, that sort of thing. So there's you know, this capitalist system of supermarkets with inputs and outputs, and you know, the input is food and the output is money, and I don't see it like that. I see it as you know, there's, there's this much more circular thing. So by, by taking food out of the dumpster and, and feeding it to people, I'm, I'm providing human society this, this service that it wouldn't otherwise have. So it's like I'm filling in an ecological niche that was not filled. And, and so that, that's how I, I conceive it, it's not like I'm trying to overflow anything, you know, I'm not, I'm not being a rebel, I'm, I'm filling a hole. I don't know exactly why, but there is nothing that I've been more sure of in my life than the fact that, like, I need to be living communally. So everything that I'm doing with the Gleaner's Kitchen, I mean, yes, it's about food, yes, it's about waste, but on, on a much more deeper philosophical level, it's about building community. Those early days of the Gleaner's Kitchen, they were exhilarating. I made a Kickstarter video which went viral, and soon I was on NPR and Time Magazine and Huffington Post. I even got to publish a book. But the project was undermined by my ignorance of property law, and very soon we were evicted. Hi everyone, so this is a very sad update. Uh, we just got evicted from our location for the summer. Um, we're in scrambling mode, we don't really know what we're doing. Um, there'll be a more detailed update in the next few days and weeks to give you a better idea of what the future of the Cleaner's Kitchen looks like. The eviction left me feeling more homeless than I'd ever felt in my life. I had tried to create a shared space and it had just totally backfired and I was devastated. I spent some years wandering and eventually I realized that all of the ideas that motivated me really required a pretty sturdy theoretical foundation, so I decided to go to grad school and committed to making a home in Binghamton. I began to study with the biologist David Sloan Wilson, the renowned popularizer of multi-level selection theory. Multi-level selection gave me this language for talking about that feeling that I'd had, that feeling of being not quite Maximus, but not quite Crafts House either, that feeling of being more than yourself. The way that it works is multi-level selection says that just as natural selection can act on individuals, crafting individual traits, hands and noses and eyes and what have you, so too can natural selection act on groups of organisms, crafting group level traits. Occasionally, in some small percentage of circumstances, this can develop into a full-blown superorganism, an identity on a higher order. I think these ideas are important specifically because they can be put to use in building stronger communities. So last year, I started Binghamton's first collective house, the Genome Collective. A genome is sort of like this symbolic representation of an organism's identity, so the name the Genome Collective is meant to evoke this idea that a collective house can be a sort of living creature with a self. Like the Gleaner's Kitchen before it, the Genome Collective is dedicated to food justice, and we do a lot of dumpster diving, and we've catered some events in Binghamton. Last May, we catered a Black Lives Matter protest, and we've catered a number of other events, and more recently, we catered the Honk Festival, the 11th Annual Honk Festival, which is this activist marching band festival in Boston. Honk is an activist festival, which means that it has an agenda, but its agenda isn't something specific or opposed, like stopping fracking or police brutality. There is much which Honk is against, but what is far more important and more nebulous is what Honk stands for. My contribution to the festival came from the dumpster. Thousands of dollars of juice fed 400 musicians, but it's misleading to think of dumpstering as a protest against food waste per se. Serving all that dumpstered food does little to address the root cause of the waste, at least not in the way that a new law might do. So cooking with dumpstered food isn't as much against wasting food as it is for building community. So 
The community of the Genome Collective is built around our relationship to food. In addition to dumpstering, we take care of a large outdoor garden and manage an indoor mushroom farm which produces 10 pounds of oyster mushrooms a week that we sell to local grocery stores like Old Barn Hollow. Here is an educational video I made about the reproductive cycle of an oyster mushroom as an analogy for communal living. Heterozygote Advantage says unequivocally that a plurality of voices, even contradictory voices, can produce fitter, more flexible identities than any voice possibly could in isolation. I consider videos like this, too, to be a form of activism. When scientific knowledge is kept inside the ivory tower, it tends to just reify an oppressive class system. But when that knowledge is translated into online video form, like this, it can reach people who had no access before to any kind of university education. Videos on my YouTube channel have been viewed by over 80,000 people. Here's a clip from a video that I made about the GMO debate that was published in the anarchist journal Slingshot. Genetic modification has the potential of producing highly specific, ecologically sensitive methods to control pests. Unfortunately, the way we've been using genetic modification has served to increase, not decrease, our ecological footprint. Each semester I've spent at Binghamton University, I've taught a class which uses online video extensively. The first class I taught was called Evo Tivo, where we started an educational YouTube channel. <laughs> Evo Tivo is an educational YouTube channel run completely by Binghamton University students. We're offering a two-credit class next semester. If you want to help, send us an email or subscribe to our channel. The next class I taught was called the Evos Fermentarium, where we learned about the biology and mythology of fermentation and made videos about our products. Of course, all the ingredients were dumpstered. This is the Evos Fermentarium brand kombucha, and in this video we're going to show you how we make it. <laughs> <laughs> this, right here, this is a scoby. It's a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast, meaning in this little white mat, there are many species, many bacterial species and yeast species, and they're all living together in this wonderful symbiosis, and they've produced this material, which is their body. This semester, I'm teaching a completely online graduate-level seminar in biosemiotics. Our weekly discussions take place in a video chat room, and we record our reading responses in video form and upload them to the YouTube channel, Evo Tivo. I've really enjoyed the reading this week. Uh, Deacon's work is amazing. I found this symbol concept to be quite a challenging piece of literature. I've taught these classes in the ways that I have, in the subjects that I have, because I believe that education needs to be democratized. We believe that the walls of the ivory tower are too high. They separate the rich from the poor, the black from the white, the scientists from the artists, in ways that don't just make real an oppressive economic system, but also in ways that are intellectually bereft. This is footage of the Cambium Research Institute, a new project that I'm working on with the Federation of Egalitarian Communities. The FEC is this fantastic network of 100% income-sharing communes. I first started working with them when their group called From Point A came to the Genome Collective last year to run a workshop on consensus-based decision-making. And the Cambium Research Institute emerged out of this workshop from a shared recognition between us that the communities movement could be greatly strengthened by a scholastic perspective. By placing our institute inside of a network of intentional communities, we give our ideas the space to return to a more ancient form of scholasticism. Scholasticism is not exclusively about the discovery of new facts, but also about integrating those facts into a communal conversation. It's the dialectic, the act of communication, which makes the pursuit of knowledge meaningful. We do not seek to remove ourselves from the world by living atop a tower. Our intellectual pursuits have grounded purpose. We seek to make life in our community better. This is scholarship for community by community. We seek to live a life filled with potent, meaningful exchange of understanding, a life of empathy, because it is by communicating that we can come to understand our place together inside this fascinating world. 
recently, the Cambium Research Institute and From Point A collaborated on a workshop in evolutionary game theory at the annual NASCO conference. NASCO, the North American Students of Cooperation, is an organization dedicated to helping cooperative houses like the Genome Collective, and from giving this workshop, it just became so clear to me that there's this untapped niche in academia for an institution that can provide rigorous theoretical training, but also the practical skills like cooking or farming or consensus-based decision-making that are required for vibrant, robust communities to flourish. I view the Cambium Research Institute as an application of Antonio Gramsci's idea of praxis. In the prison notebooks, Gramsci writes about the need for organic intellectuals, individuals who use theory not in isolation, but as part of an active practice in social questioning. Organic intellectuals use theory to help clarify the identity of the group they represent and to assist that group in its practical, political functioning. Walter Rodney was an organic intellectual par excellence, and I seek his award because I wish to include myself in that lineage. I haven't felt the racial injustices that Rodney wrote about as acutely as he felt them, but still, the underlying colonial forces that shaped his reality have also shaped mine. This winter, I will be traveling again to Palestine to follow up a video I made two years ago. Hello. Today, I offer you a story about a wall, but really, it's a story about identity. In January of 2015, I was given a free trip to Israel by the Birthright Organization. My parents were Jewish, and so I was given a right by birth to travel through lands that people who were actually born there had no longer a right to live in. This video is my attempt to process that paradox, the paradox that is Israel and Palestine. I developed a gruesome fascination with the walls that divided the two lands. This wall has divided Jerusalem from centuries of invaders. This wall divides Jews from Muslims. This wall divides Israelis from Palestinians. These walls reify distinctions that come to us all too instinctively. This is us. This is them. Humans make boundaries out of symbols as well as limestone. In rare cases, we require stones to physically protect our bodies, but usually we use them to preserve who we think we are. Barriers aren't supposed to create perfect isolation. Rather, they create a channel through which self and other are co-created. There is only one way this conflict can end. Eventually, the wall will fall, and the states will merge. But left in the rubble, there will still be two peoples, still calling the same place home. Rodney could uncontroversially claim to his supporters that We are an African people. Yet, despite Zionism's strong parallels to the Back to Africa movement, I cannot identify with the analogous claim that I have a right to Israeli heritage, or, more critically, that I have a right to Palestinian land. Zionism contains a perverse mythology, radicalized by the Holocaust. The myth says that a homeland is the exclusive right of a single group, and that the injustices of the past justify the injustices of the present. The myth says that I can somehow compensate for the Nazi murder of my great-grandparents by colonizing Palestine. This myth is toxic, but it shouldn't be ignored. It's powerful because it provides its believers with identity. I think that the only way that we can combat a myth like this is to create new ones. So before I end, let me share with you one more story about home. The Albany Bulb is an artificial peninsula in the San Francisco Bay. From 1963 until 1983, Approximately 2 million cubic yards of garbage and demolished buildings were dumped into the bay, creating 60 acres of new land. Over the following decades, a community of outcasts emerged from the rubble and transformed the wasteland into their home. 
This video documents their voices. On a slab of concrete, where land meets the sea, was written the following letter. The letter came from a time when eviction was imminent and the writer needed help. They wrote, Here and there, in sections leveled and cleared of rebar, our tents are hidden away. We live around and with and in the rubble. Live, not merely survive. Can you see how hopeful this is? The letter requested that we advocate for the bulb. They wrote, You can help them understand that we are not agentless statistics. We are not summed up neatly by a term like homeless. We are not without intelligence and we are not without voices. We are not without voices. The power of a narrative whether it's written in a holy text or painted on a concrete slab, is that it can crystallize identity in time. The letter was addressed to anyone who could read it, but still it felt like I was being spoken to directly by that anonymous squatter. You must let suffering speak if you want to hear the truth. They asked me to speak about their home in ways that others would understand, and so make videos about home. Now, making a video about Palestinian refugees contributes to a solution to the conflict in that same fruitless way that dumpster diving solves food waste. Making a video about the Albany Bulb in no way prevented their eviction, but I don't believe that that's the right metric to judge the value of these activities. Even if they do very little to address the injustices that they are about, Narratives work nonetheless. One story at a time, they erode the hegemonic culture that makes injustice possible in the first place. I build community because by living in this way, every meal that I eat with friends becomes an act of resistance. This is praxis. The way that we live molds the stories that we tell, and the stories that we tell mold the way that we live. Walter Rodney gave his life trying to change the narrative surrounding slavery and colonization, and although the details are very different, I find myself responding to those same forces of displacement 40 years later. Colonization demands that we respond to it by articulating our identities, and this act, the act of saying who we are and living accordingly, to me, this is the essence of scholar activism.